since Hamas has invaded Israel and have murdered thousands of people and kidnapped hundreds of people, there has been a real actual crisis going on in Israel. Something also going on is a mental health crisis. Whether you are a Jewish person living in Israel or living in the United States or wherever you are in the world, you're worried, you're concerned for your brothers, your sisters, and yourself, frankly. And we have a show on this platform on Living the Time called That's an Issue, where we have conversations with professionals and people in the field of mental health. And we met someone named Dr. Shlemy Zimmerman. We like to call him Dr. Z, who we're working on certain projects with him. And we called an emergency press conference with him to go over the most common questions that he is getting. They are by the thousands and people are looking for answers from a real mental health professional of what they can do. So Living the Time presents Dr. Z, on the most common questions that people have in regards to their mental health, how they could stay as safe as possible. Here's Dr. Z. I was asked to address a number of questions that have come to us from people in all sorts of different situations regarding the extremely difficult situation in Eretz Israel. And I'll just try to take a few minutes to address those questions. First question that came is, many times I don't feel so connected to the situation in Israel. I also feel very badly because I'm concerned about my own seemingly trivial things. Is there something wrong with me? And I think this question is something that many people are struggling with on different levels. And while I think it's absolutely beautiful to see all the ways that cholesterol is encouraging people to be empathic, be noisibaol, to do positive things, davening, learning, chesed, it, it's unbelievable what's going on. But it's also very important for adults, and especially for children, to learn to make space for all of their humanness, for all the whole array of thoughts and feelings that they have, their full spectrum of their humanity. At times, a person might feel really badly about what's going on, feel really connected, and at times they might feel totally disconnected from it. And despite that everything, the situation in Eretz Yisrael may bring up for me, I'm also very likely to have all the same thoughts and feelings I had prior to that. So all the mundane aspects of my life, all the little things that might bother me, whether my coffee is too hot or too cold, they're all going to come up. It's just part of what it means to be human. We are not angels, and very few of us have the level of obviously stroll that we're going to be completely consumed constantly by the plight of our brothers and sisters. We're going to have our humanness. Even the greatest people had theirs. So it's important to remember that. And the goal then is, yes, I want to focus. I want to be connected. I want to do something positive. But I don't want to beat myself up. I don't want to get stuck in any guilt or shame about my feelings, my actions or inactions. So I want to embrace my full humanness, all of me. And where I feel that I'm being too trivial or too small, I can redirect myself to still stay calm because I have betachen and I want to work on that. I want to be besimcha while still being noise and feeling empathy and compassion for the plight of the so many of our brothers and sisters who are suffering enormously now. And then I want to pick something small that I find meaningful to commit to, which I have a really, really high likelihood of actually being able to fulfill, to pick that as my Kabbalah, my commitment to go and do that, to help be a part of the army, that is the entirety of Kalah Yisrael, that we're all trying to fight the physical and spiritual battle on behalf of all of Kalah Yisrael, especially our brothers and sisters in Eretz Yisrael. Another question that had come in is, as parents, we're all trying to protect and guide our children, and preventing exposure to graphic news and imagery is an important part of that. But how do we go about that properly? And I think that's crucial because the natural gut instinct is, okay, what's the big deal? I'm going to go home and take away all the devices or I'm going to just delete the apps. But that's very unlikely that working from a top-down fashion is going to be helpful. It often actually backfires and causes kids to go underground or rebel. Whenever possible, we always want to work with rather than do to children. We also want to empathize with the very human need that so many of us, children and adults, have to watch the news and see videos and even see something very graphic at times. And there are many, many different healthy and unhealthy psychological aspects to that. Um, for many of us, we don't find that we feel enough and we're hoping that some of the imagery and some of the news will help us connect and feel. 
For some, it gives a sense of control. I know what's going on, which is really obviously a pseudo sense of control, but it does give me that illusion that I know what's happening, things are okay, I'm able to evaluate the risk and things like that. For others, it's simple curiosity. And for many, there's a deep part of us that is drawn to horror. Horror movies sell to millions and millions of people throughout the world. And there is a part of the human that looks for that. And these are all just some of the aspects that come up for all of us. And it's important to acknowledge the normal want and the drive for children and adolescents to seek this. And especially if they've been using those devices and technology or apps to get their news and to be connected to the world, to all of a sudden put a hard stop is going to be challenging. So what's important is to try to see if we can communicate with them openly and get the adolescents especially on board to realize, hey, this might not be in my best interest. This might not be the best way. This might have long-term impact on me psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. And let's see if I can cut this out or at least significantly curtail it. But we never just want to repeal. We always want to replace. So what can we offer them in terms of how will they be in the know? And what level of information can they expect? And can we find healthy sources or healthy adults in their lives to provide information and support to them throughout the process? We also, the most important aspect of adult-child interactions is modeling. And if we're going to talk to them about stopping or significantly reducing their technology use and use of social media, then we have to model that first and foremost. And we can't be constantly checking our phones or running off to a different room and not being present or connected with our children and be telling them, oh, but it's, it's not okay for you. That's a hypocritical message that often backfires. So we need to work hard to do the work first and model it for them. And lastly, no matter what, what our, you know, we, we, we pull off taking away the devices or the kids acknowledge or we get rid of those apps, inevitably they're going to hear and likely see certain things that are distressing to them. We need to keep the lines of communication open. We need to let them know they can talk to us even if they've made a mistake, even if they've seen or heard things that we wouldn't want them to, that they can still come to us and they can still process with us that we're not going to condemn them, that we're going to be there with them to deal with this situation that's extremely difficult. As an important addition to that, that's largely aimed at teens or children who might even be remotely appropriate to have such devices or technologies. But we need to remember that for younger children, especially those from like between eight and 10 and younger, they don't have a fully developed sense of time and space yet. And so for them, the fact that this attack might have been a few days ago and is thousands of miles away might be irrelevant, especially if the adults around them are giving off feelings of anxiousness, of worry, of concern, of disconnection, etc., etc. They will feel that and they will feel like it's here for them. They don't have a sense, oh, you're safe here. That's just over there. We're worried about our brothers and sisters. It'll merge for them. They won't necessarily have any sense of safety and serenity here. And it's important that we highlight for them the ways in which that they are safe and secure. And to reiterate that for them and to constantly remember that we might be saying something casually with the assumption that, oh, of course, they'll realize that that's happening over there. But that is not the case for younger children at all. And we need to be mindful of that throughout this process. Another question that came in is how do we address when people are bothered by the question of why bad things happen to good people. And now, obviously, I'm not here to address the question that has been plaguing Chazal, including Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, throughout history. But just to give some response, I think one of the best responses I ever heard was from Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Zatzal, actually less than two months before his petir, while he knew that he was you know, seriously, seriously ill, he was on a podcast and when he was asked that question, he said the following. He said that he's come to understand in his older years that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not want us to understand why bad things happen to good people. Because if we understood, we'd be forced to accept that bad things happen to good people. We would understand it, we would get it, and we would go along with it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not want us to accept that bad things happen to good people. He wants us to not understand so that we'll go and fight bad and evil and injustice throughout the world. And that's why, he says, there's no answer to that question while we're still here on this world. 
because HaKadosh Baruch Hu arranged it, arranged it specifically that way so that we will fight against the darkness and will bring light wherever we possibly can. Another broad question that came in is how can we respond to these events in a healthy way and be resilient? So as I talked about earlier, I think one of the most important things is that we allow ourselves and our children to experience the full range of human experience, the full range of emotions. That's from being connected and hurt and anxious and sad to being numb and at times joyous and proud. And sometimes those are happening simultaneously or within seconds, we're having all of that range. And to embrace that that's what it means to be human and that's what it means to have a full range of emotions. And that's what it means to have both the Yetzir Hara and the Yetzir Toiv, that we're gonna have light and darkness constantly, fully, integrated in our world and we have to deal with that another crucial piece is that as psychologically healthy people and as jews we don't take on a victim mentality of course we have to eradicate threats and evil but we don't get busy blaming if anything on the contrary we've always introspected we always turn inwards and say what can we do be be doing better now you have to do that carefully you have to be able to do that from a place of healthy pride, a healthy sense of self, a healthy sense of b'ni b'chayr Yisrael, am a chelik elikami mal, that I am holy, beloved, and cherished, and extremely worthy, but there is an area that needs help, both on my individual level and collectively. So we always turn inwards and we introspect. And what the research has shown is for firefighters, let's say who've been exposed to trauma, if they want to have something that's called post-traumatic growth, where not only do you survive or you're resilient, but you actually grow in a positive way from exposure to trauma, one of the most crucial influences of whether firefighters would experience post-traumatic growth was their ability to deliberately ruminate. And in that case, it didn't mean just to forever think about what was going on, but on the opposite. It meant purposely thinking about their experience and try to identify the benefits of that experience. What did going through that or hearing about that or seeing that help me appreciate in myself, in others? And that is something that I think, Kalei we can do enormously well. We can look around and just see our response and try to find the ways in which how can I grow as a person and how are we growing together as a nation in response to this? And hopefully a lot of us can experience post-traumatic growth through this. Another crucial piece, which is at the bedrock of what it is to be a healthy person and a Jew, is to find meaning. Perhaps most famously, Viktor Frankl, who was a Jewish psychiatrist during the Holocaust, he had the following quote. He said, we who lived in the concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they are sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's own attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. That sense of what makes a human a human and why we're here is what we call Bechira, the freedom to choose. And situations can become exceedingly difficult and limit that choice, but there's always some place where we can choose. And that is what we have to do here. And I think it's incredible for us to look around and see. And we keep hearing and seeing it on display. Me ka'amcha Yisrael. Look around. What does Kla Yisrael do? How do they find meaning? They introspect. They daven. They learn. They work on bitachin. They get up and do chesed. There are people flying back to Israel to fight. There are people sending everything they can to Eretz Yisrael. There's tzedakahs on all fronts. It is absolutely incredible, so many different ways in which we're finding a place to find positive meaning and to take positive action in response to some of the most brutal and heinous and degraded things known to mankind. And also to remember that contrast, it helps us remember who we are when we look at the other side and we say that is the koyach of darkness, that is the koyach of the Yetzirah, of Yishmol, of Sitra Acher, however you want to frame it. And this is the koyach of the Yetzir Toiv, of Klal Yisrael, of what it means to be a humane, good person. We take tragedy and we rebuild 
and we go forward and we help others. We help ourselves grow. We help others grow and we do whatever it takes and we form connections and bonds and we remember why we're here on this world is to choose even in the hardest times to choose and to choose the right way and to choose light over darkness. Another element of this and that can be helpful for both us and our children is to remember who we are and where we are. Sometimes just go outside, open the window and whether you're in New York or New Jersey, whether you're Ashkenazi or Sephardi, remember that within the last 80 years or less, so many of our grandparents, great grandparents were in totally other countries where they had lives that were completely disrupted, where other nations, the Nazis and what was going on in Syria and Jewry through in Russia and in so many places, our ancestors not long ago suffered unbelievably things that are beyond human comprehension. And many of them are no longer in those countries and those countries, some of them are free of Jews entirely. But look around where we are today. Look around at our communities, at our shuls, at our yeshivas, at our moistas, at our chesed organizations. We have it within us. It is in our DNA to go through tragedy and to persevere and to have post-traumatic growth. And we've been resilient before. And so this sadly is not new for us. This is our tale that's as long as Gullus. But it is a tale that we have seen chapters of this before. And we need to remind ourselves of our capacity and even just look in the mirror and say, did my grandparents think for a second that we would be alive and here and thriving in the way that we are today? Nobody in their wildest dreams could have. So that is a helpful thing to help us get through while we're still in this enormous challenge to remember we've been in these kinds of situations before and we've prevailed and with Hashem's help, we will prevail again. An element of that, which can be difficult, and especially for some kids, especially if they've been through a lot, they might be bothered by, is this what it means to be the chosen nation? And is this what we're chosen for? And we have to remember that we weren't chosen for an easy life. We weren't chosen because it's going to be smooth sailing. We were the opposite. We were chosen to bring divine light into the darkest of places. And I think one of the stories that brings that home incredibly powerfully, at least for me, was the Kloisenberger Rebbe Zatzal, who lived during the Holocaust and he lost his wife and 11 children. When the Nazis first invaded Kloisenberg, they picked a group of Jews and particularly the Rebbe and were taunting him. They were picking at his beard and pulling at it and pushing him and shoving him and doing all sorts of taunts. And they said to him, do you still believe that you're the chosen people? And the Rebbe, in a completely serene way, said yes. That infuriated a Nazi, and he picked up his rifle and he smashed it on the Rebbe's head. And the Rebbe crumpled to the ground. And the Nazi said, now look at yourself. Look at you on the floor, beaten down, on the ground, with us on top of you. Do you still feel that you're chosen? And the Rebbe, again, in a serene, calm, strong voice, said yes. The Nazi lost it and started just pummeling and kicking at their head and said, how could you believe that you're the chosen people when you're down here being beaten and abused and you're nothing here? And the Rebbe said, as long as we are not the ones kicking and beating innocent people, we can call ourselves chosen. We have to remember here, we are not the ones who are barbarians, who take Holocaust victims hostage who kill innocent women and children and behead babies. The others are the ones doing that. We're the chosen ones because under every situation that we're put in, we do the right thing. We bring light. We bring honesty, integrity, compassion, humanity. We will have to fight darkness and protect ourselves from our enemies. But we're always on the side of truth and light. And lastly, in terms of that, it's important to remember that we're still here. As Rav Yaakov Emden famously said, 
that in his mind, the greatest miracle a Klal Yisrael ever experienced, perhaps more than leaving Mitzrayim or anything, is our survival. He says, on a natural human understanding level, it makes absolutely no sense. We are a tiny people that the greatest nations throughout history with the greatest armies and the most barbaric tactics have tried to eradicate us. And no matter what they have tried to do, no matter how hard they tried, including most recently with the Holocaust, with a final solution, where are they and where are we? Klai Yisrael is still here. We are here as individuals and Klai Yisrael collectively as a nation. We are here, we are intact, and we are strong. And look at the growth we had after the Holocaust and the expulsion from so many of our Middle Eastern countries and from the Russian oppression and the communists. We're here. And we're here to stay. And beyond that, we're here to bring the Geula. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu bring it to us. Bekarov Mamish. We should all go up to Eretz Yisrael in peace and harmony as the light of the nations that we are intended to be. Bimheir of Yomenu. Amen.